Welcome to the Mayo Clinic Cardiovascular Continuing Medical Education Podcast. Join us each week to discuss the most pressing topics in cardiology and gain valuable insights that can be directly applied to your practice. Hello, I'm Dr. Steve Kopetsky, a preventive cardiologist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. It's my pleasure today to be speaking with Dr. Iftikhar Klo, who is a professor of medicine here at Mayo in Rochester and one of our preventive cardiologists. We'll be talking about genetic testing in cardiovascular disease. So Iftikhar, welcome. Thank you, Steve. Pleasure to be joining you today. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. You know, the, the, the genetic testing has really come ab about in the last few years, a large part due to your research. Why is genetic testing needed for coronary risk stratification? Well, Steve, uh, we every day use, um, you know, uh, calculators for risk stratification, and that's a great tool we have as preventive cardiologists, and we have to thank people who kind of developed those uh, calculators, particularly the Framingham investigators, Dr. Kennel and team, and that's really a fantastic resource for us. And we've used that, and that was developed 60 years ago, and we've been people into low risk, intermediate risk, high risk. But as you know, and um, many of us see in our practice, many of these patients, when they develop an event, if you had done their risk estimate the day before, they would not have been high risk. And so we um, do see a lot of patients that uh, would not be predicted as high risk using these equations. So there's clearly a need for us to improve them. And it's been 60 years since they were developed, and as yet there's no single biomarker that's in these pooled cohort equations. And I think genetic risk um, assessment provides a very exciting new avenue for us to improve these risk prediction equations. Very interesting. So how do you assess genetic risk for coronary disease? Well, everybody, all of us have a very simple tool, and that's family history. We should absolutely never miss to ascertain family history in all our patients. And as cardiologists, we are typically interested in CHD, and generally any first degree relative, male less than 55, female less than 65, we mm -hmm. say that's family history. And we, um, that is very helpful. It captures not only some genetic factors, but also environmental factors that the family may have been exposed to. Mm -hmm. So that's a very simple, um, easy, cheap genomic tool, I would say. And uh, the risk ranges from 1.5 to twofold higher when you have a family history with a first degree relative having premature CHD. But more interestingly, recently, we have this opportunity to measure genetic risk scores. And what those involve is you know, we have these what we call polymorphisms, and even though we are 99.9% .9 similar, these the remaining variation determines how we look, how we behave, what our susceptibility to disease is. Mm -hmm. And that's true for CHD as well. And uh, we have done these large uh, genome-wide association studies, and they have shown uh, or revealed multiple susceptibility genetic variants, up to about 200 nearly at present. So if we take an individual and measure these 200 or so variants, we can you know, uh, get an assessment of what their genetic risk score is simply by counting the number of risk variants at each locus. And if you were really unfortunate, you would have two, 400 of them, and if you're very fortunate, you would have none of them. So, um, so when we um, do this in a cohort of people, the genetic risk score is bell-shaped. But then there are people at that tail end of the bell shape that are at high risk, and that's where this um, profiling is really helpful. Also very interesting. And are these uh, individual markers, these 200 markers, do you weight them differently? Yes, or? that's an excellent point. So we can, the simplest way is to just count them, right? Count how many risk alleles are. But you can weight them, uh, weighting them by the strength of their association with the disease. So some SNPs are more strongly associated. The strongest, as you know, is the 9P21 locus. And then there's a whole host that are weaker in association. But the field has actually moved on, Steve, now. Uh, so when we say there are, let's say, 200, we set a very high bar. So the p-value has to be 5 into 10 to the minus 8. So that's a pretty high bar. And people started looking at the variants that were not that were significant, but were not significant at that level, and they found there was enough inform additional information. So now people, what we are using are called genome-wide scores, where we take millions of SNPs and take their p-values, and um, and it it's been shown that when you calculate a genome-wide risk score, they're actually stronger than the ones that you would do from just a limited set. 
So that's mm -hmm. where the field has moved now. And I see. And then uh, this, so this polygenic risk score, how do you use it to assess risk? So the beauty of these, Steve, is that uh, they are almost completely uncorrelated with the Framingham or the pool cohort equations. So because they're not correlated, you can simply multiply, you know, the two together to get a 10-year estimate. And so let's say somebody's polygenic risk score puts them at 1.5-fold higher, and that patient's um, uh, predicted 10-year risk is 7%. So you can simply multiply 7 into 1.5, and that puts you, I think, at 10-plus risk, and that potentially makes you a candidate for statin use. So that's the nice thing that you can actually put integrate the two together. I see. And if these things, are they starting to creep into the guidelines, the polygenic risk scores, or how are they treated? So at this point, the ACCHA guidelines do not, um, uh, you know, incorporate them. But if you look at the AHA 2020 uh, statement on heart disease, there's a very nice, um, you know, uh, description of these. It talks about family history. It talks about polygenic risk scores. So at this point, they're not in the guidelines, but I suspect that eventually they will be because there's so much data showing that these are incremental to these pool cohort equations and they're not correlated. So that if you take the two together, you get a more refined risk assessment. Mm -hmm. And so who, who's your typical patient now you use this in? What, if you see a patient that they come in and say, I have a, you know, my father had a heart attack at age 50, or do you, how do you, uh, how do you uh, factor it in? Yeah, the interesting thing, Steve, is that um, for some reason, they are not very strongly correlated with family history. Otherwise, you could make the case, well, if I took the family history, why do I need the polygenic risk score? But they're not. They give different means of information. So I would say the best category of individuals would be uh, the intermediate risk or those who have a family history because intermediate risk, the AHA recommends adjuncts that includes uh, calcium scoring, LPA or CRP, but I think the polygenic risk score could also be one such adjunct. Mm -hmm. And you would then reclassify these intermediate risk individuals into higher low risk. Okay, so just like anything else, the intermediate patients are the ones you focus on. I would say that's where, because you know if the patient's high risk based on conventional risk yeah. factors, you're going to treat them. Sure. So additional information may not be all that critical, but I think in the intermediate risk group is where they may, there might be the best utility initially. Okay. And to be clear, these, uh, this polygenic risk score does not include LPA or lipoprotein A or other things that would code for like hypertension or hyperlipidemia. These are all separate factors. Is these that are, that's a great question. Actually, they do. So if you take all of these risk factors that are associated with CHD, some of them are, some of those genetic variants are associated with CHD because they're associated with lipids. So you might ask, well, if the lipids and blood pressure are in the pool cohort, why are we adding these factors? Well, we've seen that if you take a blood pressure measure, it's today's blood pressure, but the genetic risk for blood pressure tells you your accumulated exposure to high blood pressure over time. And the same is true for lipids. So even though these elements are there, even if you add these additional genetic risk factors, it doesn't seem to uh, have too much of uh, correlation or overlap. So it's safe to you know, include them as well. Okay. And how, how are these available now? Are they widely available? And you know, how, do you, how do you utilize them? Well, they have been actually available for a long time, but through direct-to-consumer companies like 23andMe, the problem there is that their uh, genetic risk scores are somewhat antiquated uh, to my best of my knowledge, and the, the way they calculate them is not clear. So I wouldn't really be using that in, in clinical practice. So I think Mayo is probably one of the only institutions that's offering this. Uh, we, we started this, as you know, after the MyGene study, and it includes um, about 30 risk variants. And now we are moving to upgrade this genetic risk score so that we are now offering the genome-wide risk um, uh, polygenic risk score, which is much, stro much stronger. And I, I'm aware of many other efforts, both in England uh, and the UK and the US. Other sites are interested and in, about to offer these. And we hope to offer a genome-wide polygenic risk score for CHD also in the near future. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. And then you mentioned uh, combining with Framingham. Uh, how do you, do you combine it with the, with the calcium score? Is yeah, that so that's, a, that's another very interesting question. If you have the calcium score, where does a polygenic risk come in? Well, Steve, the way I see it is that, you know, this is going to be a very cheap test where you can, let's say, genotype somebody and you can calculate the risk of many diseases, not just 
DHT. And therefore, there's so much utility, you can extract so much information, you can do a colon cancer risk, breast cancer risk assessment from the same chip. So my sense is that in the future, this would become routine, and you can actually measure this risk at age 20 or in, in teens, and it will project your lifetime genetic risk for that condition. And, um, and it could potentially be just incorporated into the routine risk calculators because it's going to be cheap and available. And then you can use that combined risk to determine what to do. For example, should we do a CT scan earlier in this patient or put them on a statin earlier? Or should I do a colonoscopy if that colon cancer risk is high earlier? So I would say that the two would be adjunct and not necessarily competing. I see. Yeah. So say, if Carl, you see two patients one day. Yeah. The first patient comes in, you do the, the risk score, and he has, they have nothing. Right. The next patient you see, all 400 are positive. Okay. How do you, do you tell the first one, go do whatever you want, don't worry, you're not gonna get disease, and the, and the second one you say, oh my gosh, you know, this is a fait accompli, <laughs> or how do you approach them? <laughs> yeah, I think that's a great question, because people, patients have that concept that genetics is determinism. It's not. It's something you can change. And so the person that had a low genetic risk score, if he went out and ate burgers and smoked, he's going to get CHD at some point, right? It's going to be high risk. And the person who has a very high risk, if he or she modulates their lifestyle and uh, if needed takes a statin, we, there are studies showing that that genetic risk is significantly reduced. So I think it's a very really important point to make that genetics is not your destiny necessarily, and you can alter it by lifestyle modification or by treatment of risk factors. Okay, well that's fascinating information. Uh, anything else we need to discuss? Well, I just wanted to mention that uh, this polygenic risk scores are just one facet of genetic testing. You know, there's a lot of other interesting things coming down the road. Um, you know, epigenetics is one of them. Uh, and then there's a, um, a phenomenon called CHIP, which is um, clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential. And, uh, and then expression profiles. And I shouldn't, of course, forget to mention our favorite uh, disease, FH, which um, you know, is monogenic, and we should, not, uh, we should be aware of that condition in people who have early disease or have high cholesterol. And we shouldn't forget that there's genetic testing available for that as well. So be, I, I, would, I think the message would be there are some patients who, whose disease is probably related to FH particularly if they had it early on, had high cholesterol or had family history. So in those cases, we should certainly uh, consider genetic testing for FH. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, very true. That's a very important disease to genetic test. Well, this has been a fascinating uh, discussion today with Dr. Iftikhar Kalo, one of our genetic experts here in cardiology and cardiovascular prevention. Thank you, Iftikhar, for joining us. Thank you, Steve. It was a pleasure. Thank you for joining us today. Feel free to share your thoughts and suggestions about the podcast by emailing cvselfstudy at mayo.edu. Be sure to subscribe to the Mayo Clinic Cardiovascular CME podcast on your favorite platform and tune in each week to explore today's most pressing cardiology topics with your colleagues at Mayo Clinic.